looks weird. You know, why does that matter? Um, and secondly, like I was hovering over your avatar for just trying to invite you on, <laughs> but I, I, then I, I couldn't do it. So I had to appoint you as a speaker, which I don't know, allowed you to get on somehow. So it's like, you just added layers of stuff that it's going to complicate for users to do. So, uh, so yeah, it's a little bit annoying. And in fact, the only thing users care about on live streaming platforms like this is, is it fast? Is it easy? And does it help audience growth? Um, like I don't care about the widgets. I want to know whether the platform is going to help um, uh, Crowdcast and Brit Food Live grow. So that's the only thing really you should be building towards. But, yeah. you know. We get over engineering all the time. Anyway, folks, welcome to Brain Food Live on Air, bringing it to you every Friday, no fail. Um, uh, today, uh, we are, we've got a super exciting show for you um, because this is something that's been on my mind for a little while. Not as a person that's ever been a, kind of a victim of this, um, although I get the, the, the feeling that these days it probably won't happen to me as much as it maybe should. Uh, but I know many of us have had the situation where you get publicly called out um and i think that can be actually a very difficult and challenging thing to do and to approach like how do you handle that um especially when it can always feel like a personal attack um and people's response to attack is quite obvious it's quite natural you get defensive and you can shout back and before you know it you're descending into um you know kind of a very unpleasant interaction which by the way is very very common online so uh, how do you do that has it happened to you uh and if so what do we do about it that is the topic of today how have you been put on blast on public <laughs> in public by an unhappy job candidate how are you meant to respond okay that's the topic of the show uh, so if that's what you're meant to be watching then good on you um all right let's um let's firstly do some sound checks uh, there has been a lot of jiggery pokery, by the way, um, on the back end on tech. I know I'm bitching about it a lot, but there has been an API issue with LinkedIn to restream. So I think we might not be restreaming to LinkedIn today. Um, but anyway, uh, Crowdcast, if you can sort of see or hear me okay, let me know in the chat. Audio and visual, we should be fine. Um, if you are on LinkedIn um, and you have attended or said you were going to attend any of the 10 events I created uh, in order to uh, set this up, uh, do let me know um, and let me know whether you can hear or see me okay. I think Michael Blakely is actually live streaming this. So Michael, thank you very much. Uh, I am definitely not live streaming it. Um, so at least somebody is, but other people can actually see on LinkedIn, which is good. Um, so yeah, that's just my bad. Sorry, guys. Um, all right. Um, we welcome back Adam Gordon after he's completed his suspension for insubordination. Um, well, welcome back, Adam. I hope you're contrite and, and well behaved. Um, I think you, I think you, um, said, um, that like, this is the, the challenge with building in public is that you only really get to know what's going on on social media. So I found out about my suspension, um, uh, on LinkedIn and found out that it was for insubordination, but I haven't actually got any feedback around what the insubordination was or how I can behave better next time. That is, feedback's not required in this case. Um, I, I think it's very similar to like Victorian prisons where it's like, just reflect on your behavior, mate. You know what I mean? Go, 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 go down for 10 years, reflect on your behavior and come back a Christian man. Um, that's, the, uh, that's the policy. Um, anyway. The truth is I've done nothing but reflect ever since. Yeah. <laughs> so just bear I've, up, I've spent I? all my time thinking about it. <laughs> I know you've been watching every show as well, just like desperate to get on. So, uh, so yeah, yes. um, like all, all of the, all of the twists on the outside. Um, all right. Um, listen, Adam, I hope you're well. Um, and, but uh, by the way, I know it's been exciting for you as well. I hope this little break has been helpful in terms of you getting your show on the road where you've got to go. So big news happening next week for you, isn't it? So, um, uh, I don't know whether you want to talk about that real quick or, or whether you want to save it to the big bang or whatnot. Um, maybe a few words would be useful actually. Oh, me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah. Um, well, look, um, there's a there's a type of if you're not familiar with sales enablement, there's a type of there's a type of like process and professional and uh, technology in mainstream sales called sales enablement. And um, it, it, it really streamlines workflows and um, makes the job of doing sales uh, considerably less stressful. So I learned about this last year and I was thinking about it in terms of recruitment going. Why, why, why don't we do anything like that in recruitment? Most recruiters I know are 
stressed out their mind, spending half their day trying to find the content or assets or processes or whatever it is to actually complete their tasks. So, you know, beyond the applicant tracking system, which does a great job of managing your recs, there's a heck of a lot of other tasks that recruiters need to do. So we've built a recruiter enablement workspace. Um, it provides solutions for marketing operations, learning and, and bringing tools together. And we're launching it on the 17th of October. So less than well, I don't know, 11, day, 11, 11 days away. And I'm getting very excited. And I've taken loads of feedback in this private beta program we've been running. And I've been listening to people and going, brilliant. OK, we'll make our baby a little bit better in this area and a little bit better, bit better in this area. But now I'm at the point where my baby's absolutely beautiful and well behaved. And I'm kind of getting angry with any feedback that's <laughs> telling me my baby's not great now. Um, so I'm only joking. I'm still looking for more feedback. But this is this product's now shit hot and um, it's going to be I'm, I'm really, really excited. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to say a couple of words on it. No worries, man. Um, check it out. Keep your eyes out on Tuesday. It's going to drop. Um, OK, cool. Let's get on with the show. In fact, before we get on with the show, we always have to thank our sponsors because every week a company comes on and sponsors Brain Food Live on air without whom we cannot continue this show. Um, so today uh, we've got one of our repeat sponsors who's been so um, uh, much of a support for Brain Food and also the recruitment co recruiting community at large. Uh, there are very good friends at, at Adway. Um, and in fact, if you haven't, or you're not aware of Adway, you need to be. Uh, lots of wonderful tech coming out of uh, sort of Sweden. Um, they've got some really interesting sort of uh, technology um, uh, and uh, de dealing with basically programmatic advertising into social spaces. Uh, which when you think about the sort of candidates you want to interact with, they're not on LinkedIn. Uh, they're not like always on the job boards. They're on social media, on their places where they want to be. TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever. You want to interact with those folks, you need to be able to put your advert to them when they are wanting to consume information. That's what Adway does, uh, programmatic advertising for uh, social. But anyway, why am I talking to you about this? Because we can bring on uh, the wonderful Sarah uh, Dalsfeld. She's going to help talk us all about it. So let's uh, bring on Sarah um, and see what she's got to say. There's lots of really interesting announcements as well um, that uh, you should be aware of with Adway. And I'm going to let Sarah talk about that because um it is something that you know basically you need to listen to this lady speak in any case um there she <laughs> is of course there she is i tell you what sarah you look hey. always so pro i mean oh, wow. for real i mean look at the, look at look at this background look at the lighting yeah i'm, I'm ashamed. getting the a here I'm, we go I'm, there you go i'm ashamed i'm ashamed uh, <laughs> of uh, of this what is this off-white stuff terrible anyway Sarah, listen, wonderful to see you. Um, why don't you quickly introduce yourself? Who are you? What it is you do? And tell us what Adway is and, and who should care about it. Yeah, first of all, Adway loves Brain Food Live and we love to hang out on you, especially on Fridays, Adam and Hang in the community. That is the best thing ever to do. So, yes, my name is Sarah. I'm head of brand and community at Adway. And my work is literally to make sure that our community, customers, and partners is in the absolute limelight of talent attraction. And to your point, Adam, there's a lot of tasks on recruiters and TA professionals tables. So we've built during the past five years a talent attraction system that really covers it all. So it goes from attract, convert, engage into predicting recruitment, mar uh, <laughs> recruitment marketing ROI and to predict your bottom line impact. So we work in deep, deep dive with AI and machine learning to make sure this happens for global employers. Fantastic stuff. And tell us about some of the exciting things that you've got coming up, uh, Sarah, because you've, oh. you've, you've got a cool <laughs> report that's out and you've also got a big event to come. So tell us a bit about those two things. Yeah, 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 naturally. So we just released our annual social recruiting trend report already downloaded by, I think now 1500 TA professionals globally. Crazy. So let me put in the link in the comment section so we can share it with the community for free. Go ahead, guys. I don't know if the link shows in the comment section. Otherwise, I think, Hang, you can send it out. Yeah, you can click on that. You can yeah, click yeah. On. Yep, it's clickable, uh, yeah. 
fab for free. Uh, the second is uh, we can, I think we can announce, Hang, you were one of the speakers at our upcoming UK summit, and uh, that is for heads of TAs. It's a strategic roundtable session, and we are flying in some really cool speakers. So on the 9th of November, everyone, if you're into strategic TA, you're very welcome to join. I think we have around five spots left, so <laughs> fight for it, but it's going to be amazing, and I'm looking forward to seeing you there, Hang. There, there we go. The only reason why I'm there, folks, is because Sarah failed to actually um, acquire the optimal people she wanted to do the talk. <laughs> and uh, it was like, just, just call who's available, who's oh, going to say yes shoot. to things. Um, so, yes. Um, and is, is this an invite only event, Sarah, or is it yeah. like available to yes. it is invite but only? I mean, for, I mean, for the brain food community, naturally, we can do some adjustments, right? Okay, so if they're interested, how do they get into this? Um, so the link to the landing page to today's event uh, takes them to the to the summit where you can register. Otherwise, I'll share it again in the uh, comment section and perhaps, yeah, you can... Uh, yeah, so sure register, folks. If you're interested, let's get together, have a chat. Adway always put on fantastic events. Um, and this is their annual summit um, in the UK once a year. Yeah. So it will be a big one. So... Uh, Absolutely. Sa Sarah, listen, wonderful to see you. Um, thank you so much for delivering uh, that uh, monologue for us. And I guess I'll see you in a couple of weeks later. Yeah. Right? Um, and we'll, we'll catch up from there. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. I am a massive Adway fan, just for the record. Yeah, they're interesting. And they're in a category of themselves, as far as I can see. Um, and... You know what? I do think we need to do something interesting. We should do a show on this because advertising, I think, is getting increasingly difficult, particularly when you advertise on traditional job board type places. Have you seen how candidates are using uh, generative AI to mass apply um, to uh, your large numbers of jobs, 200, 2000 jobs at a time? So I'm thinking you have to put your adverts somewhere else if you're going to do it because you're going to get completely overwhelmed. Um, I mean, that's a, a, let me know in the chat whether you want me to do that show where we're talking about candidate usage of artificial intelligence um, and have you seen it? Uh, and if so, are you adapting to it? Are you just going to absorb it or is there a way, you know, is, is it influencing how you kind of think about structuring your, uh, your recruiting? Anyway, Adam, we're well over time. Let's dive into the uh, newsletter, man. Give us a couple of things you want to talk about. Um, right. Okay. First of all, let's talk about Chronify's candidate expectations report. Um, you and I did a show with them this week. I think you you hosted a show with them this week, mm. and um, I I I think that candidate expectations are absolutely acceptable, but we are not meeting them typically as um, employers. So forty percent of candidates expect an interview to be arranged no more than six days after they've made their application. There shouldn't be any reason why we can't meet that objective, that expectation today. No reason at all. 56% um, of candidates in the US say that responsiveness is the most important thing that they are looking for in a hiring process. And it was very high everywhere else as well. It was over 50%, 52% in the UK and high everywhere else as well. Yeah, it's 40, very interesting. Can, 40, can did, 40, go on. 41% of people have said that a lack of communication is the most frustrating part of a recruitment process. I mean, it's not acceptable in, in 2023 that we're getting that wrong. It's really easy to set up autoresponder messages and let people give people transparency. Like go through the process yourself, and if you don't like it, then change it. I think I think you're right, bro. I, I do also think it's not just recruiters being bad. I think it's there's a certain degree of where there's probably a lack of control as to how jobs appear. Um, you know, how do you create a job? Uh, is there a central control on that, or you've got a distributed way of doing it? You can imagine a hiring manager saying, "Stuff this, I'm doing it myself," and then off it goes. Or if you're a recruiter and you've got a credit somewhere, you, you, off you go, you post that, and it's not in system, um, and therefore you know you, you've created something that's outside of the controls, uh, which pro you, you can potentially manage it better. But I think also you've got this kind of unpredictable nature of how many candidates might apply for job, um, which can simply overwhelm 
um, your setup. So for instance, you might anticipate getting 100 candidates for a job advert you put out, um, and you get 1,000. Um, unless you've got some sort of really elastic way to scale up your resourcing, you're going to let a lot of people down because you haven't organized yourself for it. Yes, you can use automation. Yes, AI is going to help. But if those pieces aren't in place, then you're going to be exposed. So, and, and by the way, this is going to get worse with candidate usage of mass application. So I'm not saying this is endemic, but you can understand candidate using to, tools to create mass personalized applications to lots of different jobs. That makes sense to me. If I was a job seeker, I would do that. Um, but we might be looking at a times 10x applicant rate um, and that would be chaos. There's no way we can do that. Um, so we need to kind of meet AI with AI. We're going to end up in that situation where both sides will be using AI to interact with each other before two humans interact. So, you know, we have to get there first. It's going to be very interesting, very exciting, but also I think fairly messy as we kind of stumble towards this future that is definitely going to come. Um, okay, cool. Chronify reports there, very digestible, very easy and not gated either. So just go ahead and download it. It's right there. Uh, okay. Give us a couple more, Adam. Let's talk about the, um, let's talk about the salaries you've got to pay for AI engineers. So AI appears to be the um, highest paying job in tech now with everybody from Goldman Sachs to P&G to Walmart paying six-figure salaries for pretty entry-level sort of AI, ML, engineer jobs. And uh, famously, recently, Netflix um, offering pretty, pretty broad range between $300,000 and $900,000 for a role as a machine learning product platform product man manager, effectively. Yeah. Um, it is the hot job for some obvious reasons, um, being like the accessibility of artificial intelligence today and therefore the demands on supply chain for people with those skills. So um, exciting trend. If you've got kids below the age of about 18, you've got to let them know about this type of work as something they should be thinking about? Um, I think you absolutely need to direct people towards it, even though I'm pretty confident kids are already all over this um, because it, it, it's it's ubiquitous. They're going to be well, well ahead. It, it's almost like I feel more confident for, let's say, 16, 17-year-olds today because they're going to enter into a workforce that's already AI-enabled they were coming into AI enabled. The people I feel sorry for are the individuals that may have just got into work maybe two, three years or so ago. Um, and the, the, they may just be wrestling early in their career, need to build network, and they've got to learn another thing to learn. Um, it's going to be very exciting. You, you're grimacing, Adam, and I'll, 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 yeah, no. I'll, I'll, I'll find out why in a bit. But if anybody's interested in compensation, I'm actually going to be doing a webinar, custom webinar with figures on compensation and how AI has impacted that. That's happening towards the end of this month. I will share the link in the chat stream a bit later, but make sure you register for that if you're interested in how uh, we think AI is going to impact uh, not only compensation, but also how we calculate compensation. So it's going to be very, very interesting. Uh, uh, sorry, Adam, go ahead. I was going to say, um... A, a, a couple of things about that. I, I did a, I, I, I spent an hour with some uh, like lower sixth kids at like, so 16, 17 year olds at um, the school that I went to last weekend doing, giving them some like just career advice. And I asked them all like, what are you thinking about doing? And I was extremely impressed with the fact that they like, so almost all of them said, yeah, I want to be an aeronautical engineer or I want to be this or that. And it was really quite specific things. But then when the people said to me, yeah, I'm going to be a family lawyer, like my mom or my dad, I'm thinking, I don't think you should go into family law. That's an area that doesn't need to exist um, very soon because people could just punch in, what's my chances of getting a settlement from this or whatever, and they'll get the answers. So the other thing is, I think you were a bit optimistic about like the... Um, understanding that young people have around what the proper jobs of the future are. So I bumped into a friend of mine who works in construction yesterday, and he said he's absolutely gobsmacked at the lack of people coming in to work as electricians and things like that, because they can earn really, really big salaries. Um, and my sister told me, who is a teacher, that 
I don't think it was the top, but it was certainly the top three, um, like, career aspiration for people in her school is to be an influencer. Like, the world, the world can only have so many Hung Lees, yeah? Hey, and Jake, hey, and Jake Paul's. No, <laughs> for me, I don't want to be associated with Jake Paul any time. Um, but um, I don't think it's a it, look. I think influencing as a as a journey is 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 definitely not a, a path to go. I think that year is almost over anyway. I think AI is going to wipe influencers out um, because we're going to end up being influenced by artificially generated deep fakes. Um, they're going to be more fun. Um, so I think it's going to be difficult to to recommend that as a path. But I think you're right. There's maybe a lot of naivete for the young young people. I was naive at 17, 18. Oh, yes, I mean, who isn't? Uh, we don't know the world of work. We we absolutely need to bring the world of work closer to, to kids at an earlier stage. You can't just be jettisoning, like just the, the, uh, dispersing kids into the workplace at 18 or 21 or whatever it is and say, off you go, apply for some jobs. No one's got a clue. You've got to give them work training like really early on every summer from 12. Go and do something that is related in some business and get educated that way. So um, I, I think that's going to be something we really need to look at at a, at a society level. Um, but yes, it's very interesting on comp where we need to be with AI and all the rest of it. OK, give us one more before we, uh, we get on with this show, um, Adam. Right. Well, as somebody who's quite young myself, obviously, I'm, I'm pretty interested in the concept that older people are less innovative. Um, and so I found that really quite enlightening. Um, the concept of fluid versus crystallized intelligence was one that um, I thought was, thought was really interesting. So fluid intelligence, meaning um, you are not confined by what you've learned and there's a lot of different directions that your mind could go um, when thinking about um, innovate, innovation or even just like solving tasks and things like that. Whereas for older people, they've got a lot more crystallized intelligence, which means they, they've learned a lot of stuff and that maybe their beliefs are a little bit more um, fixed. Um, however, uh, it, it, simply put, younger people know jack shit and older people know an awful lot, but it might not be right. So when that comes into thinking about the types of innovation that exist, that was also really interesting because there's three different types which are cited in this blog. One is disruptive innovation, which young people are much better at because of their fluid intelligence. They can see different ways of doing things, which... The crystallized intelligence is like just just hasn't considered because their way of looking at the world was was not quite the same twenty years ago or forty years ago or whatever when that process was 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 created. Um, and then there's the, the the two which actually are um, very um, well used by older people with crystallized intelligence, which is efficiency innovation and sustaining innovation, and that's all about. Um, incremental improvements to products and services and processes. So are older people less innovative? I mean, the answer is no, but they have a different type of innovation that they can bring to the game. Yeah, it's, it's actually a controversial topic. And um, I actually posted this topic into a, a, a kind of a, a news group and it got banned um, as, as flagged as like hate speech or something, which obviously is, is, it's at that level where people are intolerant of even considering the possibility that biological age actually has an influence on, on how your brain operates. Whereas, of course, we know that's true. I mean, anybody's been observing sort of how biology works. Clearly, the brain changes over time and there's a there's a pattern to it. And actually, it really took um, a, a fantastic author called Letitia Vido to, 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 to make the case in such a way that it was accessible and, and not critical in any way and, and to expand the conversation rather than narrow it down and constrain it. Um, and the bottom line is. Ageism is real. We have to combat that. That's a responsibility for us in, in recruitment and in HR. But age is also real. Um, so we can't just ignore the fact that actually as you get older, things are going to change. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean change for better or worse. But the reason why we grow to a, a very venerable age as a species is because older people have value in society. That's how we kind of have evolved as a social species. You'll notice that other species where... You know, once you stop going, um, uh, once you finish reproduction, if you like, you die off. 
because there's no genetic purpose for you anymore. Well, that's not how human beings work. Uh, human beings live far after they finish their reproductive life. In fact, most of their lives are when they're not reproductive. Therefore, we have got things to offer the rest of society. Now, can we create jobs that actually take that into account rather than just ignore the facts and saying, yeah, you know, this is this is not true. So really important blog, follow Letitia Vido, of course, wonderful person in that our space. All right, we've got to get on with this show because uh, Nadia is waiting for us. Um, and just to contextualize this for everybody, I just wanted to let you know why we're doing this show. Um, we had a really interesting blog post which featured into um, a recruiting brain food about a month ago where we had a, a really unhappy candidate um, come on to uh, onto LinkedIn and, and essentially posted a very long uh, sort of critique of uh, her experience going through the candidate journey. Uh, and it was one of those like multi comment type of uh, type of uh, co uh, uh, posts, which I thought you know, is actually really well written. And it seemed that, you know, there was some substance to her uh, annoyance and it just reflected, OK, maybe this is a kind of experience issue um, and, and it's uh, it's something that we need to learn from. So I'm going to share that link into the um, uh, it's a lady called uh, Sarah Frank. So I'm going to share that link into the uh, chat stream there. Um, have a look at that. I'll click, click it open once you uh, sort of listen to what I'm about to say. Um, and then uh, sort of Nadia, who is a representative of the company uh, that was uh, uh, so put on blast. Um, hey, Sarah, how are you doing? <laughs> Wonderful to see you. I might actually bring you on screen if you're, if you're for it in a bit. Um, but then we had sort of a, a wonderful response. I thought a really strong response from a uh, from the, the head of people of the company. Um, and I thought innovative use of the Loom video, innovative sort of use of being public and being sort of uh, really prompt, I believe, in that response. Um, so I thought that was really great to see. So I'll also share the Loom video for this. Um, and I don't know whether you get the time to actually watch this, guys. So obviously on screen now, I'd love to play both things for you, but I understand from uh, sort of crowd cash, I'm not able to do that and you won't be able to hear anything, but their assets and uh, sort of resources would give you a bit of context as to where you're at. Um, all right, so before we bring Nadia on and possibly Sarah as well, um, Adam, I'm gonna go to you first. Have you ever had this experience where there's been, something's happened and then it's gone public. Basically the criticism's gonna come at you in a, in, a, in, a, in a public way. I mean, other than you, uh, <laughs> not, not really, no. But I mean, I've got a pretty straightforward playbook for this, um, you know, if that happens. And that would be bring, bring my gun to the knife fight, uh, fight fire with fire, don't back down. Complete this sounds like terrible advice. This. this sounds terrible. I'm, um, only, I'm, well, only, I'm only joking. I look forward to finding out what the experts say. No, but I tell you, that's sometimes a technique. I mean, it's not, it's not a pleasant one. Um, but when, you know, you have this in online arguments, don't you? Um, where if, if someone's upset, the other person completely overreacts uh, in, in an effort to basically make sure there's no response back and to kill the conversation off often doesn't have work because you that overreaction stimulates a responsive overreaction and then you get a flame war and then it's like it's a complete disaster so that also is not a good thing um i have to say from my side as well i don't have a huge amount of experience of this um i mean there's there's been occasions where people have had to go and there's been occasions where, where i've actually disgraced myself and you know unfortunately got involved in such a conflict and i actually taught myself a lesson never to do that again um, because I realized I went irate super, super fast. Like I went to nuclear amazingly fast uh, on a person that firstly, I didn't even know. Um, I never heard of before. And, you know, five minutes ago, I actually didn't even know this person existed. And I had to check myself because my, my temperature was at like 150 degrees C uh, to the point where I was looking the guy up and thinking, where does he live? You know, that, that kind of level. And I said, you know, what the heck are you doing? You know, what are you going to do? Hong? Are you going to go see this guy? You know, are you, are you, are you, are you, are you an idiot? Um, so that's, that's when I realized, okay, you have literally gone off the, at the deep end. You've lost your sanity. You need to just step away and examine exactly how this happened. Um, and, and since that time, that's why you know, typically I don't get involved in conflict at all. You know, if someone has a go, you just got to let it slide. It's like, there's nothing I can do. Um, so, so yeah, it's difficult. But um, let's see um, how we're going to go. Um, Nadia, I'm going to bring you on first because that was the schedule. Let's do this. Um, and then we'll see what this experience is all about. Uh, Nadia, I believe you're in. Um, I think it's true. 
Oh no. Is that right? It's one of these I where I can't wait for the day somebody comes on and it's not the right person. It will happen one of these days. Um, but uh, Nadia, I reckon that's you. <laughs> it's like I, I should instruct people to put their names on. Um, I think you do instruct that, don't you? <laughs> No, I, I think it defaults that way, but I've noticed actually they have now a, a permitted anonymous sign-ins. Um, so I think a lot of people will start signing in anonymously and that's going to confuse the heck out of it because I obviously then I can't identify who's who. Um, so, so yeah, whoever's whoever's sort of in as N, um, you're, you're, you've been invited. Um, and Nadia, I hope that's you. If not, please make yourself uh, known um, in the chat um and we'll see where we're at um yeah oh by the way folks if you can do me a favor i'm getting loads of dms on linkedin they're saying hung where's this show is not happening would you mind just taking the url of this 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 show now paste it into linkedin somewhere and saying if you want to watch this click on that and register sorry everybody um but basically it's not gone out to uh literally the 10 events i've created <laughs> in a row so it looks really bad um, so there's loads of people sign up to those events and it's not actually playing. So it's like a bit of a disgrace. Um, but, um, but yeah, I'm blaming the tech. Um, so, all right, I don't think Nadia's here. Is that right? I don't know. Um, all right, we we'll have to we we'll have to see where we're at. I don't know. Show more. Cool. Oh yeah, by the way, folks, um, whilst we're kind of fiddling around with this and we're making sure everyone's able to get on screen properly, um, why don't we uh, take a moment, as we always do in any case um, in this show, uh, grab your LinkedIn URL and share it in the chat stream um, and make sure you uh, connect with everyone who does the same. Um, I don't know whether anybody's aware, but I think there is going to be some sort of uh, restriction on LinkedIn um so in other words the numbers of invites i think are going to be additionally constrained um i believe it goes down to something like 100 a week or something um and inevitably um that is going to frustrate um the amount of network growth everyone has um that i think has a huge issue in terms of the utility of something that we all use it inevitably is going to push you to pay linkedin recruiter what is 15k a year or whatnot Come on, I mean, make sure you have an extensive network and you can get as much value out of the free account um, as you can get elsewhere. Um, all right, I don't think, um, as, as Nadia made herself available, she literally did message me to say she was here. Um, but I think maybe... Nadia, comment in the chat. Yeah, Nadia, can you comment on the chat? I can't read anything else. Let me just see if she's emailed me. Um, okay, she has emailed me. Uh, Nadia, I need to. Uh, you might be there, but I need to know what you what your name is, basically. Um, and I think it is N. Uh, all right, she's definitely here. We just got to be a bit patient, guys. Um, Are you in as Michael? Don't know. Um, there's, there's a Mike. Michael has said Nadia is here with. Michael, is that you? Could be. Michael, is that you, Nadia? Oh, so Michael's saying I can see her. Um, I, I can just see an N, but she's already been invited, though. All right, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll uninvite and reinvite. I think that's how it works. Okay, cool. All right, Nadia, there should be a, a pop-up coming on your screen to say, join the thing. So just say yes to that um, and you should be in, I think. Um, yeah, it's, you know what? It's one of these, I think, where the, 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 the things like cookie banners and, and uh, you know, consent bar banners and all this type of stuff is, is, is really damaged the, the impact of models. Because um, yes. when, you, when you pop something up, your instinct is just to get rid of it um and it's like okay we've trained ourselves literally to just simply blast things away uh without understanding that sometimes a model is how you get on um so um so yes um okay looks like we're struggling still oh. everyone's missed you adam um 
Happy to be back. I don't have a lot to add. I'm spent now. Yeah, that's it. Done all of the, done all of the work. No, I don't think Nadia's coming. All right. Um, bring Sarah on. I'm going to do that. Um, so Nadia, we're going to bring you on in a moment. Have a fiddle with it. Let me know in the chat where you're at, though, uh, because I'm just a little bit thinking, um, you know, why is it that you can't come on? I wonder whether that's something to do with um, a model or something. But we have to move on. Um, let's... Uh, da, da, da. Okay, we're still not getting there. People... Someone request to join? No. No. You used no. to be able to. The old bre the old um, Crowdcast was better, in my opinion. Uh, it, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like mega confusing. Um, and it's, uh, it's annoying for everybody, basically, because y you spend a lot of time trying to fiddle with it when actually... I'll tell you how we've done it. We've basically designed it with the, with the, with, on the proviso that there's like some, somebody helping. Um, uh, and, uh, oh... It's Nadia. It's not. It's not Nadia Lisakova. It's not. Um, so yeah. All right. Don't worry. It Nadia is. But Fatalidis. There's no name like that on the on the screen. Um, cool. Let's bring Sarah on. And Nadia, let let us know in chat. I think that's the only way in which we're gonna basically understand whether you, you you're actually uh, watching this in the right place. Could be you're watching it on Michael's LinkedIn, for instance, and people get confused a little bit with that um so uh so no worries all right we've got a surprise guest here this is going to be interesting um sarah uh, frank i'm going to bring you on i hope this is okay um there should be a model popping up just accept that um and we should be able to see you jim said you can request to join uh no not michael don't shut it down it's nothing to do with you um but, no, but you could put a, a comment, Michael, on the. Uh, you could put a comment on it to say, "Will the real Nadia please stand up?" No, no, it's fine. It's fine. She's definitely here. She emailed me just now. But anyway, we have Sarah. Sarah Frank here. Sarah, wonderful to see you. Thank you so much. Hi, hi. Um, for um, for joining. Um, hey, I missed I missed my original invite to uh, join the chat. No, what do, you, what do you mean? I mean, I just, you're here. I mean, you right now, so. No, I meant you invited Nadia, but you didn't invite me. No, I didn't. I oh. didn't realize that you would be interested in doing it. It was like, okay, yeah. um, let's have a look at what sort of, what it's all, or how it's all working. But yeah. why don't we quickly introduce yourself, Sarah? Would you quickly introduce yourself? Who are you? What is you do? Yeah, sure. So I'm Sarah. I've been a recruiter since 2010. And I also do career coaching for people with ADHD, specifically women um, who are looking to move into new roles within tech, because that's kind of my bread and butter. Occasionally, I do contract recruiting now, um, and I live in Rome, Italy. Cool, cool. Wonderful stuff. And I've just shared uh, Sarah's LinkedIn there, so make sure you connect. Yeah. Uh, with Sarah, if uh, if you're interested in any of her work, okay, Sarah, let's contextualize this uh, right from the, spool it back right from the beginning. So I understood, as far as I know, you applied for a job with Test Gorilla, um, and then yep. there was there was obviously not an optimal experience for you as you went through. So take us through sort of what happened there. There she is, Nadia's here. Fine, Nadia, we'll bring you on, but we've got Sarah on now, so let's go, yeah, go and sure. hear from Sarah first. We'll bring Nadia on a bit later. Okay, great. Sure. So um, I have been, I've had the mindset because I got married a couple of years ago and I have thought that I might want to have kids in the future. And so I have been very casually open to the idea of working for a company full time so that I could have maternity leave. So, and I say that because any small business entrepreneur knows that uh, if you're a business of one, you can't really take time off. And um so anyway, that made my decision to seek out a job. And I actually had followed Nadia for a number of years because she had posted a handbook, a company handbook uh, at her prior company. And I thought it had some really great people forward stuff in it. And I happened to see um, that there was a job open at the company she had just joined. And I kind of checked out the, uh, the product of the company. And I thought, you know, this could be really interesting. Also, you know, I do coach people. So not only am I sort of like eating the dog food that I tell my candidates to do, 
Um, I think it's also good for people that are trying to give advice to other people to go through a process themselves. Now, of course, I was actually interested in the job. So um, I took the initial test, which was an hour. And basically what they've come up with is uh, different modules to test that you build to test for specific roles that you're hiring for. So for the recruiting, there were a few different things, not just like recruiting. It was also like logic and, and a couple other. And without pulling up my post, I probably won't remember all of those details. But um, so there are a few different things that it tested you on. And basically, if you're above the bar, you get to move forward in the next step. So I was above the bar and um, I was contacted by their recruiter. And this is kind of where like, like my hackles got raised just a little bit because one of the things that I have really tried to focus on is being an excellent communicator to my candidates because I know how crappy it feels to be ghosted. Um, and part of the reason why I do career coaching and I've done it since 2017 is because I think that if you as a recruiter are not kind of in the trenches and know what people go through when they're applying for a job, it can make you really jaded and start seeing people not as people, but as resumes. And so all of that is to say, I, um, my hackles got a little raised because the recruiter emailed me on a weekend where I had a, a family emergency and I was out of town um, and it was like end of the day, we were going to visit a family member in the hospital and I didn't happen to see the invite inviting me to an interview that I believe was like Monday. Well, because I didn't see it, uh, it, I was never asked, hey, what is your availability? And so it was kind of assumptive and I just personally, that's not how I, um, that's not how I recruit is I try to be flexible to the people that I'm working with. And so when I said, hey, I, I had a family emergency, I'm so sorry I missed that. I have been um, I have been checking my email and I just happened to miss this. I'm super sorry. I'm still interested. And so we were scheduled. So on the call, um, in talking to this person, I found out what the steps of the process were. And I also found out information about the role and the job description that I wasn't clear from the job description. So the second part that kind of raised my hackles was that I thought the job description was um, a little, I mean, it was, there were aspects of it that were incorrect, but it also felt a little unfair that some of those details wouldn't be given to people before they spent the hour taking the test. So for instance, this is a contractor role. It's not a full-time role, but it's not phrased as a contract role anywhere at the time on the job description. And to me, I think that that's like, that's just like bad. I wouldn't do that. Um, because Yeah, I think I thought that was disrespectful. And um, on top of that, you know, I, I chatted with the recruiter. I had a great call. Um, they were going to be going on vacation. And I didn't know this until I emailed them which is another thing I feel like you kind of and, and I want to I don't want to lay into the recruiter too hard because like we're all human and every recruiter is the best recruiter somebody's worked with and every that same recruiter is the worst recruiter somebody's worked with so like I get it um but I I say that because once again it wasn't what's your availability could you share a calendar or something it was like here's when you're talking to this person so after I chatted with them, I emailed them and I, the recruiter, and I said, hey, um, just wanted to uh, let you know, I, I will actually be, or I, I think I said a thank you first, and I got, um, and I, and I got a, a response that they were going to be going on vacation. I said, hey, actually, I got their out of, out of office, not a personalized email saying, hey, here's, here's what is going to happen because I'm going on vacation, here's when I'm available, which again, I think is kind of like client forward, which you need to be doing. So I'm trying to wrap this up quickly. So after that, we're going back and forth. I had a great conversation with Beverly who, who does their HR and she's really awesome. And I thought this is the person I can solve tough problems with. And I think, you know, maybe these issues that I'm having, we can talk about it in the future and 
make it better for everybody. So I'll continue with the process. So then I was leaving on vacation. She wasn't back. And I had a funeral. That family member that we went to visit in the hospital had passed. And I actually had like a court de deposition for something. It was just a lot. I didn't push back in the way that I should have to say, hey, look, when I, when I got the email that said the next is a three-hour assessment, when are you free? And so it had to be coordinated quickly. And I said in the email, is this paid or do you donate to charity? Tell me a little bit about that. I didn't get an answer. And this was my bad. I should have said or sent, sent a receipt afterwards and said, here's my contracting <laughs> fees. Here's how you can pay me for the work I just did for you. And I say that because the assignment I was given was to talk through um, how I would implement um, a software for the company. I'm, I'm not trying to rat out their whole pro Well, maybe I did on LinkedIn. So they wanted me to implement an, an ATS. And personally, that's like a rec ops job. That's not a recruiter job necessarily. And there, once again, was no mention of this on the job description as part of the job. And I would think if this is the most important thing that they are looking for from a hire, that they would have that in the job description. So that is where all my beef came from. I don't have an issue with the company. I just think their process is really bad. So after I got rejected because I wasn't granular enough about my long-term plan, I looked at their glass door, which I looked at before, and then I clicked on their interviews, which I had never thought to think of before. And there were multiple places where other people had mentioned that they had a horrible experience. And I thought, you know what? It's time for a little manifesto because this was really bad in a lot of different ways. And um, yeah, I'm just, I'm going to put that online because I coach people and I want people to know that like, I'm not perfect and I get scared to stand up for myself too. And it's okay. And also like, I'm a recruiter. I know how processes are supposed to work. This isn't how a process is supposed to work. So. No, thank you very much for, for, go, for t talking us through that, Sarah. Um, I know sometimes these things aren't easy to do, and um, especially as uh, there was obviously an emotional journey that everyone sort of went through as well. So uh, I thank you for, uh, for, for coming onto screen at short notice um, and being able to uh, tell us exactly sort of what your thought process was um, and why you decided you wanted to go public and, 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 and put, put it out there. Um, and the critique, I think, is worth reading. I've shared it into the um, uh, the chat stream there previously. Um, I think it's still on Sarah's sort of feed. So if you want to check out sort of uh, yeah. the commentary on there, please do that. Um, uh, Sarah, I wanted to also, before I bring Nadia on, uh, and I might not sort of, um, I kind of might switch people on and off. I don't want this to be like a massive bump. No, fight, you're fine. Even though I know it won't be. Um, but but the, I want to do it probably in that style. But I wanted to get your feedback on her feedback. I mean, what did you think of, the Loom video that she recorded and, and, and that type of response. Um, well, how did that make you feel? And uh, what are your thoughts on, on that sort of after having witnessed, uh, witnessed that video? Well, I mean, I knew what I was doing when I tagged the company and et cetera. Like I was doing this because I thought this is a way to cause change because this is a terrible process. Nobody should have to go through this process in this way. Um, and that was what I wanted. I was like, I'm not going to work for this company and that's okay. Um, but I wasn't necessarily expecting a response um, because I think a lot of people, a lot of times HR tells people not to say anything. Um, I appreciate a response. I think it is so much better than nothing. Where maybe I, um, where maybe I wish that the response would have been a little different was I didn't get a good idea for like, and, and maybe it isn't the business of everybody, but I think it would have been a, a harder selling point for the company and better PR if they had said, here's where we're going to make changes. Now, by not saying that, it, you, could, you could walk away with it going like, well, do they think they were wrong? And are they looking to, to make or create changes for the future in yep. this process? Okay, yep, I get it. So essentially, 
appreciation of the video and the response i agree in most circumstances there wouldn't be any like public response at all it might have yeah been, i mean in my approach i've got to be honest would have been just to let it slide uh so i probably would have taken the uh, the coward's way out i have to say um but um the response was there and also but you're saying as the, as as something that might have been improved is that what are the the, the changes that are going to be enacted um okay can you share the specific post again yes we can someone can do that thank you very much jan Sarah, listen, stay on the call. I'm going to sure. get you off screen now. I want to get Nadia on and then we'll get her side of it. And I want to see sort of what the psychology is from the uh, the business and how to respond to critique of this type. So uh, thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. Um, wonderful to have your contribution um, uh, in this unexpected but wonderful surprise. Yeah, thank you for having me. That's great. Um, so that was Sarah's point of view. I think, you know, everyone seems to be pretty uh, sort of uh, um, understanding, I think, of that experience. It seems that, OK, everyone's had bad recruitment experiences also um, as candidates. So we all uh, sort of understand what that journey is. Let's bring on Nadia. Let's see exactly what that response was and, and get her thoughts on this. Nadia, you've been very patient. Thank you very much uh, also for wrestling uh, with the technology there. Um, Okay, finally, let's have a go. You know what, just on this note, it was because of ad blocker, and I use ad blocker as well, which blocks obviously pop-ups, um, uh, but it's one of those things that, you know, um, uh, 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 we've trained, we've trained ourselves uh, to try and avoid, so, yeah. Well, it wasn't feedback blocker, was it? No, um, let's have a look. Hopefully this will work. Like drum roll. <laughs> no, I mean I tell you again. I mean just notice that Nadia chatted to me yeah. in, in back ch in, in back chats. It's like I can't <laughs> check that I'm on air. Um, but you know what? It's not your fault. Um, so Nadia, thank you so much for for joining the show and for persisting uh, in uh, in wrestling to get on. So I appreciate you very much. Uh, Nadia, why don't you quickly introduce yourself? Who are you? What it is you do? Thanks, Hung. Uh, nothing quite like a Mac blocker um, on, on the pop-up. Uh, I've used so many platforms, but I've never used Crowdcast, so I've learned something new today. Uh, and my settings are, are ready for future. I am Head of People and Culture at Test Gorilla. I'm ex-GitLab, uh, one of my fav favorite open source uh, DevOps company to this date. i still a tiny stock options holder or shareholder and um, previous VP of people um, at remote.com. Fantastic stuff. Nadia, thank you so much for um, joining us. Um, and obviously we had a surprise. We didn't anticipate Sarah to be available, but she, she came on. She also uh, kind of explained her perspective, which I thought was really, uh, really valuable and insightful. Um, let's sort of deal with firstly, sort of how the uh, publicity first came across your sort of radar? Because I understand you weren't the direct recruiter in this position. Uh, it was published online, probably. I think the company was tagged. So presumably someone told you. Can you take us through that storyline? Like how did you come to, to be aware that this was happening online? And, and, and what, what, were the, what were the key events that led you to then do a loom on this? Yeah, as an avid member of LinkedIn um, and often keeping a close eye on our Test Gorilla pages, um, it was marked pretty pretty quickly on our end. Um, and so it wasn't difficult, you know, to get a notification on it. I do follow Test Gorilla and I'm an admin on Test Gorilla's page as well. And I think when I see things like that, um, and it happens often in the world of open source and companies that are willing to build in public, First of all, this is not the first time I'm getting constructive public feedback, right? And I think for many folks that are experiencing it the first time, it can feel highly emotional, scary, uncomfortable, vulnerable, and all those things. But that's not what it was about, right? Sarah wanted to get our attention and make sure that um, we constructively look at the things that bug her, right? And all feedback is good feedback. I live for constructive feedback, I've implemented beautiful programs at GitLab, Remote, now at Test Gorilla, when it comes to both positive and cons constructive feedback, pre-hiring, you know, and post-hiring. Um, and as a Series A tech startup, there is so much to build that many of the things Sarah mentioned was absolutely valid, but maybe things that we were already working on 
which is hard to see, right? If you don't ask for that context or if you don't have a moment to say, I want to speak to Nadia now. Interestingly enough, I do make time for that. I meet with a lot of people that get angry at us internally or externally. Um, and part of my job is to make that better, right? It's about continuous improvement and creating an amazing experience for everyone, whether that's the recruiter, the candidate, the hiring manager, our board um, and C-level team. So yeah, it's it, this is part of the journey and it's important that you pay attention to those things. Yeah, so it's interesting you mentioned sort of from a, a mental sort of approach, you're, you're, you're kind of, uh, you've got to position feedback as, as not necessarily an attack, um, even though sometimes it is an attack, but it's not useful yeah. to have that as a default um, yeah. because it, it, it's difficult then to have a constructive response. Um, and, you know, maybe the experience of, of working with a very open company like GitLab, for instance, uh, which, you know, it is a public, it's basically open source uh, software. So obviously lots of commentary going on all the time. Maybe that was a good educational sort of moment um, that helped sort of you get that, develop that mindset. I'm pretty certain the more closed the company is, the more possibly aggressive or non-committal they would be if, uh, in times of, of, of feedback. I can imagine a bank never responding in this way, for instance. I would simply ignore it. Um, uh, yeah, it wouldn't, it would just, just simply wouldn't deal, right? Yeah. So, and any, any internal comms or PR advisory would probably have said, Nadia, like, don't do that. From experience, I know this. But I didn't reach out to anyone um, to, to say, can I please get permission? I simply proceeded, created an emergency Slack channel with our amazing marketing team. And um, I would say the folks that, that truly carry our voice and said, hey, I created a loom. Give me harsh feedback. Tell me what I can change so I can create another one to respond to Sarah today. And I love that there was two folks, or there was multiple folks in that channel, including the recruiter, uh, Lauren, an amazing talent acquisition specialist here at Test Gorilla. Um, and they gave me feedback. I iterated, I created a second loom, and I posted it. There was no permission. There was no, should we do this? Shouldn't we do this? It was pretty much me saying, hey, I didn't get to meet Sarah. I really want to make sure that we are responsive and that we're actively listening to what she's saying. Um, and I had um, free Loom. I don't have paid Loom. It was five minutes. Therefore, the speed, right? And so context that might be missing, I can't go into tons of detail when I have five minutes to create a Loom. I know there's multiple ways and things to do that. At the same time, my role does entail head of people and culture holistically across all aspects of recruiting, um, talent um, acquisition as a whole, um, employee relations, labor relations, uh, people operations, um, DEI, uh, learning and development. So there's many things and components of my day. Um, I decided to make that loom and move forward from there. Um, I don't get stuck on these things for long. I tend to really listen to the feedback, look at what we're currently doing. Are there immediate actions I can take? Things that are in my control and things that aren't in my control. Um, take those actions and move forward, right? And so that's really how I approach this particular um, situation. The, the hard part is, and this is my third startup where we are dog fooding a product that I'm also utilizing in the talent acquisition or people side. The hard part of that is there's continuous improvement in a product happening at the same time that I'm using it live. It's the best way to build HR tech products Remote is such an excellent example of that, just having their HRIS go live this week or last week. I'm so impressed with Yob and the team. Um, and we were doing that, you know, as we, as we went along. So literally, as pay-as-you-go works in the world of payments, et cetera, that was very much like use-as-you-go, use-as-you-build. Like GitLab built an entire DevOps product like that as well, which isn't HR tech, but my point is, when you're using a product live, a lot can go wrong. And so I can imagine that does impact the candidate experience, but it does mean we have a certain amount of control on things we can change, things we really want to change, and things we simply don't want to change. That's part of our the product we're building as a skills and competency um, assessment platform. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Thank you for explaining the philosophy there, um, Nadia. And, you know, there's a couple of things here, that, which I think really interesting learning points. 
I think if there exists some sort of internal comms, they'll straight away say no it. Um, so this is something that it, sort of if you're a recruiter and you're dealing with someone like this, there is like there's a risk attached and you did take a risk Nadia so I, I massive credit for you for doing that uh like I say the easy thing to do would be to just sl slide it slide away and switch it and yeah. move on um the second thing is I think I, I like the fact you took leadership of it so I, I can also anticipate a situation where you might uh, some managers might have said look who was the recruiter dealing with this sort it out make it go away and then like completely delegate any sort of responsibility for it um, but that doesn't seem to have happened here. It looks like you kind of absorbed this and thought, right, I've got to take leadership, visible leadership on it um, and step forward uh, and have this dialogue. So I thought that was super impressive. Um, uh, Adam, you're going to say something soon, so I'll let you in, but I, I don't want to lose this thread just momentarily. Um, can you explain to me why you went with the loom as a, as, as, as a response? I would have thought most people might have responded text to text typically. Big text thing comes in, text comes back. Was there any thought process in your mind to say, look, a, a textual response, you didn't want to do it uh, for this instance? Um, as someone that's worked remotely since 2013 and GitLab since 2016, um, people read so much tone into text, whether it's intentional or not. I've learned the hard way that sometimes um, adding a voice, um, ideally with captions, so to be very inclusive, but, but adding a voice, adding a character to that messaging really has an impact. They, um, everyone at remote GitLab um, and Tess Gorilla might hate or love me for it, but I am that loom person. I love sending a little voice note or a little video. And so this is also deeply personal to me. Um, text can often read tone and I I really don't like that. I built asynchronous work guides, so I do guide inclusive language, um, how to use text in the most um, intentional and clear and direct way. At the same time, there was a lot to respond to in those threads, um, and I wanted to collectively, I did document every single one of them, and we're still working you know, through them internally, and I'm happy to share the actions I've taken pre Sarah's message and after her messaging um, on LinkedIn. But ultimately, a video works better, in my opinion. I would always recommend it. Do you know what? I really like that. I'm a big video person as well as people who have my uh, sort of WhatsApp know. Um, and I, again, in, uh, a lot of people hate me for it. Um, but but I, I really struggle with texting because I'm quite brusque on text. And that's my natural sort of style is to literally get to the point. And I realized that, that actually people can take it the wrong way. Um, and in fact, a video is much, uh, much more comfortable for me. Um, so yeah, please do watch Nadia's Loom video. I think it's a really good example of how to deal with um, online, any kind of criticism, public or private. Um, I think there's some techniques that we could learn there. So the first thing was to, to recogni recognize um, that, the, uh, uh, the, that you've heard the critique. Like the number one thing to do when someone has, uh, is not happy is to actually just listen and to, to, to make very clear that you've heard um because you can go straight into rebuttal without sort of having heard that's no good that's straight away going to create more and more conflict so you've got to recognize that you've heard the person and in fact most of the times if you think about when you have a fight with your family or you have a fight with your partner or whatever it is uh the the core reason is that one party feels that the other party hasn't heard them um and you're fighting to be heard that's why you raise your voice um so very very important you register that in the first instance Adam, I've been talking a lot, so uh, I think you want to say something, or at least you've got a strain in your face for some reason, so please do say yeah, something. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you for that commentary. So, uh, yeah, I, I just want to say I think Nadia chose the right medium because um, she's very believable and articulate, and so I think that video was the right thing to do. But I also want to say that you, your comment about, you know, Nadia took a risk in, in doing it this way, the flip side of that could be Nadia would have taken a risk in not responding um, and, you know, for, for a big, I wouldn't name companies, but for big utility companies and banks and things, they're not taking a risk. Everybody thinks they're shit anyway. Whereas Test Gorilla is not a brand that everybody's going to know about. And so you don't want first thing people find on Google about Test Gorilla is somebody's had a bad experience with them. You want to find that they've had a, and the, the, they've had a bad experience. And Test Gorilla has been living its values on building in public. And it's been absolutely transparent about. Um, you know, its response and, and what it's going to do from here. So 
I think this has been wonderful. Well, I, I agree and disagree. I mean, we can, we can get into the what is more risky to do. Um, uh, but I, I personally believe the, 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 the least risk is not to respond. And in, in fact, that seems to be the legal position in m many, many cases where, you know, it, it, you have a, uh, an instruction not to be here. Dude, there's a reason why we would never were never able to get like meta pe people onto the onto the screen. There's a reason why Microsoft can't come on here. There's a reason why Google can't, because they all have to sign things um in order to actually come on and when they realize it's a live stream show where anything can happen it doesn't happen um, but there's a difference so, in, there's a difference in brand there's a difference in brand between microsoft and test gorilla it's simply a maturity issue though um so, so i i think that the, the posture is still the same it's like you're you're saying you know what it's better it's, it's like lower risk not to say anything just move on um, and in fact, we, we know that on politics, mate. I mean, we can get into this sort of how politicians like never apologize, just roll on to the next thing. Um, and that's because they've been coached. This is a risk. This is risk management. Anyway, we're segueing massively. So let's not get through this. And um, we're also like running well over time. So let's kind of accelerate to um, sort of some takeaways from all of this. I mean, obviously, um, there's a re-engineering of, of the process, you know, making sure CX is improved, all of those things in progress, it's gonna be happening. We all know that's the case, but this is actually not the point of this conversation. The point of this conversation is if you do get criticism justify or not, how do you handle that? What would you say, how would you coach someone um, in your team, let's say Nadia, let's say in future, it's not you that's there that does this, um, but you need to sort of make sure that your team is equipped to handle this in, a, in, in their own way. Uh, what sort of things would you advise them and how you approach uh, public criticism that yeah you know as as uh, that, that you experienced here uh, most recently um hung i think take the risk i am a risk taker luckily Walter and otto knew that when they hired me in my big and scary transparent and open source background i built public handbooks for companies right that's part of my superpower and something i'm super proud of and love doing um and so i would always recommend to take the risk like Eat humble pie, sit down, figure out how to respond, be authentic and just do it. It's not going to be perfect. My response, I mean, I read the criticism of that and I actually stopped and shut it down. I, the responses of what people said about my response is absolutely allowed. It's their opinions, but that no longer matters to me. What mattered was a bunch of things that happened before Sarah, you know, posted that. And so this also helped me to go, hey, I have this ruthless prioritization happening in the background of improving our candidate experience, of building interview training, of going through a manager development program for the very first time that I built from scratch in a short period of being there at the company for six months, right? There's all these moving parts, but what can I do today that's authentic and real to make sure Sarah knows you are heard? We hear you, we are gonna fix this. It's gonna take some time, there's only so there's only so many hours in a day, um, and I I'm not for overwork. I don't work weekends. My team doesn't work long hours, and we focus on building a sustainable um, and efficient company, right? And the Series A means long road ahead, right? And so I think yeah, that authenticity really matters. Um, respond to Glassdoor reviews. My goodness, I read so many company reviews that doesn't respond. We have made a, a stance since I've joined to respond to every single class or review. All the managers at Tesla Gorilla would happily come on your live and tell you how I've pulled a feedback item, created a channel, ask them, hey, this is about engineering. What can we improve? Why does it work like that? What can we change? What should we iterate on? Why should we iterate on it? So I think it is really about doing the work, doing that hard work in the background, figuring out what's not working. On the scheduling aspect, you know, if things couldn't have gone worse that week, we were in the middle of an applicant tracking system implementation that of course had to integrate with our very own product and with the HRIAs we were using, right? And so it was chaos, but that's okay. Those things will always be there. Business as usual will continue to run in a startup environment as you move into scale up stages when you have the teams and the processes established. We're not there yet. Um, I'm very excited about the things we're building. We ended up you know, filling this role with someone phenomenal um, that I'm so excited about choosing us regardless of the feedback they saw and that's now successfully working with me. 
Um, but something to note is when you have one person in talent acquisition and two people in people and culture, and you're getting four or 5,000 applications, it's so hard to get back to everyone. I, I, they, there is AI for that. We are not there yet. We will get there. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I want to write about this a little bit more in terms of, you know, the unpredictable nature of applicant flow um, and why that actually ends up being a deterrent to a lot of advertising simply because um, you can't predict whether you can handle it or not. Um, and there is a price to be paid, um, potential risk, if you like, um, to do it this way. So uh, that's for a future conversation. Uh, and Nadia Vatalides, thank you so much for uh, joining the conversation. Wonderful to have you. Love to get you back and talk about other things that you're doing, because uh, I think there's lots of other conversational sort of threads that we could potentially pull together. Uh, thanks for being patient also with the tech. Um, and, uh, and yeah, let me sort of leave you at this point. So thank you so for joining us, Nadia. Thanks, Hang. All the best. Cool. That was great. Uh, guys, we're well over time because obviously we were wrestling with lots of different things and we had sort of Sarah to come on as well as, uh, as an unexpected and very welcome surprise. Uh, so we have to rush to finish here. Um, uh, folks, thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the show. We're going to be back next week. Uh, we're going to be talking about women in tech. Um, how, does it, how to make it work it, for women in tech. Um, and we've got Fia Nula O'Connor, I believe, joining us. She's done some research and data on this. Um, it's been a persistent problem uh, in terms of changing the kind of demographics of the people in technology, uh, particularly in the engineering sort of focus. Um, it's still around five, six, seven percent of hardcore engineers, if you like, they're women. Uh, Ninety plus percent uh, are men. Um, how, why is this? Why is it persistently this way? Can we do anything about it? That is the topic of the conversation next week. Make sure you follow the channel and join the show next week. Uh, we'll see you there next time. Ah, cool. Well, good, good show. Uh, um, was it, it was, was like, to so, such a mess though. I mean, I really annoyed me. I couldn't, it was like a massive dead time in the middle uh, where I couldn't bring people on. Uh, so Crowd, annoying. Crowdcast isn't, it, it's honestly gone back backwards i think um, so i'll tell you they, what they do. i criticize them on this um but they've basically built in a lot of zoom features in um they've looked at zoom as oh this is the tool that everyone uses and think i'm going to start putting back channel chats in i'm going to start putting in all of these like random features which i as someone on screen literally can't look at um do you no. know what i mean it's I, I think they basically build it for someone who's who's got like a team on the back end uh, doing all of the all the bits and yeah. then like whoever's on screen is actually not like actually operating it uh, can you switch that off you can you can roll back i don't think you can roll back to v1 anymore so no um, no but you there might be you might you might have the ability to switch it off in your environment though just so that it's not available you, you might you might not need all the functionality available within your environment it's default features mate it's literally nested in everything. So it's like Fine. not easy to find the things you've got to find. Anyway. Right, listen. What are you doing this weekend, mate? Anything interesting? Playing rugby tomorrow. Are you? Yeah. Dude. First game of the season. Playing against White Craigs. Still hoping I'm not I've I've never been I've never been promoted to the forwards yet. I'm still a back. Mate, <laughs> one of the, I mean one of these days. One of these days in fact it's if this is this is where this is where comedy injuries start occurring, mate. Um, well, if you're doing a warm up and then boom, Achilles is gone. Done. Yeah, my my mate messaged this morning to say that he went out for a run this morning, um, um, at, it, in preparation for rugby, right? And he uh, got a, got a, he had a ping in his leg, and he's like strained something or other and won't be able to play. And uh, I reminded him that to be honest, at this point, you should be tapering down his uh, fitness in a, you know the run up to the game, not starting. To do it, but now nah, I've had my I've had my I've, I'm going to touch wood when I say this. Um, broke my ankle eight nine nine nearly it was almost exactly nine years ago actually on the on the pitch. I've not had any injuries before or since. But yeah, uh, yeah, well, that's that's what I'm doing. And then I'll tell you what, boxing Saturday night. Who's on? Josh Warrington and Lee Wood, and it's going to be a barnstormer. What 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 way is that? Is that a cruiser or something? No, it's um, like uh, it is. What's the? It's the one below Josh Taylor, um, light light welterweight, something like that. 
Mm, um, nice. Yeah, no, it's good. Lee Wood's a, Lee Wood's a world champion. They've both been world champion twice. Um, big grudge match. Leeds against Nottingham. It's in Sheffield, bang in the middle. Uh, so that's going to be pretty good. What about you? Good watch. Don't know, man. I mean, uh, I've still got my mum with me, so I'm basically going to be doing stuff for her. So she's, she's here still 19, so I'm going to spend a bit more time and make sure, you know, um, take around a few places. I've looked at those things. Cool. Cool. All okay, right. Man, see you later. See you later.